Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Church. We're glad that you're able to meet with us and gather with us to worship God together. What we are doing this morning and every Sunday morning is the most important thing that we'll do all week. We come together into God's presence to meet with God's people. So during the week, we are God's church scattered, and on Sundays, we are God's church gathered. And we, as God's church, as we read in Scripture, are God's temple, the place where His special presence is made known. So Psalm 100 verse 2 says that when we worship, and this happens every Sunday when we worship, we are coming into His presence. There's nothing more important than that. Coming into the presence of our Creator and Redeemer, and we do that only through Christ, through His blood, His shed blood for us, which brings us into the very presence of God and through His Spirit that Christ has sent to dwell with us. So let's stand together. Let's hear our call to worship from Psalm 100, 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray and ask for God to meet with us in a special way this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We are in need of you. We thank you that you are with us and that we are coming into your very presence now. We pray that your spirit would minister to us through the word that we hear read and sung and preached and through the partaking and communion together. So so would you cause your presence uh, to, we know that you are present. We pray that you would be present to bless and move in our hearts in such a way that we would hear and respond and rejoice in the truth of your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We gather this morning to focus on what we must focus on every Lord's Day morning and really for the rest of our lives, and that is on the grace and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all centered uh, as a crucified Savior, risen and now reigning. One of the great scandals of the Bible, of the universe, of the gospel that is good news, is that Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says that God justifies the ungodly. Justify means to declare just or right. He does that to the ungodly. Um, For Jesus to walk on water, no problem. He's God. No one's harmed. But when God justifies the ungodly, I mean, we think about a God, he, He punishes the bad, rewards the good, right? But in the gospel, Jesus justifies, God justifies the ungodly. How can it be? The scandal of the gospel is that you and I, sinners, ungodly, not prone towards giving our lives and our trust and our allegiance and our faith to Him, instead of going our own way, doing our own thing, selfishness and pride and using our words for ourselves and hurting others, God would be so merciful and gracious to declare us just and right and good, even though we're so far from it. And that's the good news in which He comes and He deals with our problem and brings us back to Himself this morning. We are going to come to this table. It's called the Lord's table. We call it communion. It's the communion that we have with Jesus Christ and with each other that are in Jesus Christ. And so before we come to this, and I say more about that, I want to ask you to take a few minutes to confess your sins and praise him that he justifies the ungodly. Oh, Father, I pray that you would please purify our hearts 
by your mercy and grace, not because of how good we just prayed or confessed. Would you purify our hearts by your mercy and grace? And I pray that you'd give us much joy as we look away from ourselves and we look to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take communion now, and this is a time, a, a family meal for those who are part of the family of God. And if you're here and you're saying, I'm just not sure if I'm really a Christian, I haven't been baptized in his name as a believer, and I'm just not sure, we, we're just so glad you're here, and we hope in the days to come that you can join us in this. But what this is, is for those who have pledged themselves to Jesus, having turned away from their sins, put their trust in Christ, and have been baptized in his name, we come in, in, in obedience to what Jesus gave us to do, we come and take this memorial meal on a regular basis. And we come and we take literal bread, and we take literal juice from the vine, and we take it back to our seats, and in this time, we are gonna, I'm going to lead you to eat and drink, and it's a symbolic form of that Jesus. The bread is a symbol of his body was broken, and it gave us life. His, body, his blood was shed, and it gave us for forgiveness. And as we eat and drink, it is an expression of, he is my life. His death on the cross was for my forgiveness for my spiritual life. And because he died and rose again, I will live forever. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to ask those that are serving with me, the elders or deacons, if you're going to come and serve, would you come on up and I'm going to give you the elements here and get you all set. And we in after I read scripture and we will come down the outside aisles and we're going to sing a new song that's not new to some of you, but new to Faith Church. O sacred head now wounded. A song of reflection on the crucified Savior. When you came in this morning, you should have got a bulletin. And in the bulletin is, is a smaller sheet that's like kind of could be used in your Bible as a bookmark. With suggested readings from now through Easter, and it gives four sermon titles of what we're going to do as we go through what is called the Song of the Suffering Servant. So before we go and take communion, before we come and take communion, I want to read to you, and I believe it will be on the screen as well, I think that you will be helped as you focus on these words, these prophetic words, hundreds of years before Jesus was born about Jesus and his sacrifice for us. I, I'd encourage you either to look them up in Isaiah 52 verse 13 or look on the screen as I read them. When we're done, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to invite you to come to get communion. Hear the words from Isaiah. This is the suffering, the song of the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord said to Isaiah hundreds of years before. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were as astonished at you, his appearance were so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kingdoms shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they have heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, that's justified, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God through the prophet about our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would please cause our minds and our hearts to worship and trust, to thank, to believe, to hope in the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart as we ponder what he has done for us. We who were like sheep going astray, going after our own way, and he had our sin punishment laid upon him as he was tortured on a cross, marred beyond human recognition. Oh God, move and melt our hearts towards Christ. Not just in an emotional moment for a few minutes, but all of our lives. I pray that our love within our family and in with this church and in our work and in our school and in this life would come as it overflows from a deep rooted response to this love that we now celebrate, cling to and nourish our souls upon. I pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand and let's take come and receive the communion. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, we are so grateful that Jesus is better. Jesus is your greatest revelation. He is our greatest good. And God, we Love him so. And as we gather here this morning to celebrate your grace, your power, your goodness, your love, I pray that each person here this morning would be overwhelmed with Jesus. I pray that the gospel would invade our hearts in a unique way this morning. I pray that your truth would take root in our lives this morning. I pray that your words would answer questions and doubt, that your words would comfort us, that your words would rebuke us and challenge us and help us to grow. I pray that your words would give us courage, God. Lord, as we gather together, God, I I want to lift up the men of faith here today and those that are part of our church and ask God that you would help our men to be men of the word. 
Help them to love your truth, God. Help us as men to live your truth, to read your word, to have our hearts and minds saturated by your word, to seek to memorize your word, to be faithful to shepherd with your word, that your truth would invade our lives in such a unique way as men, God, that people would look at our lives, they would see the gospel, they would see your grace, they would see your mercy, they would see your love. And God, that we would be dynamic followers of you. I pray for the dads in this room here today. I pray that as dads, we would not provoke our families to wrath. But they would be faithful to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, God, that as men in our homes, we would lead in humility, that we would seek to show honor. I pray, God, that as men, we would treat our wives with dignity and respect, that the men of faith would love their wives as Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her, that we would not be selfish or self-centered or self-focused, that we would not be cutting with our words, but that we would be loving and gentle and kind and seek to live out the truths, God, that you've given us in Scripture, that we would delight in that which brings honor to you, God, I pray for the women of Faith Church. I pray that you'd help our women to flourish in their walks with you. That they would have faith in you that runs deep. That they would be lovers of the word. God, I pray that you'd work in the hearts of our ladies here at Faith Church. That you would enlarge the vision Help them to see the scope of their impact, God, both in their families and in the world to identify those areas in which you've called them to serve and minister and use their gifts, God. Give them courage, give them boldness. Help them to embrace the calling that you've placed on their lives, dear God. I pray that our women of faith would have contentment in all of the ways in which they're fearfully and wonderfully made, that they would see themselves as, as beautiful reflections of your grace and goodness, that they would rest in who you've made them to be. God, I pray that you'd give our ladies immense joy in the midst of whatever situations you've placed them in. Strengthen them, encourage them, and cause them to flourish. God, I pray for our marriages today. I pray that we would be growing in our love for each other in our marriages. I pray, God, for gospel resolution for the deep-rooted conflicts in our marriages today. That you would break the stubbornness, that you would break the pride that divides us that you would help us to see all of the ways in which the gospel mends the broken. I pray that our marriages would be characterized by humble deference to one another today. I pray that you'd give our husbands courage to lead in a way that honors Christ, that you'd give our wives the ability to follow the leadership of their husbands. I pray that our marriages would serve as an example to a world that doesn't know you. God, as I think about our body here this morning, I think of all of the burdens, all of the struggles. God, I just want to lay them at your feet this morning. I I pray for the various shepherding burdens that we have, whether it be marriages that are in crisis. God, I pray that you'd rescue those, that you draw husbands and wives to Jesus, that you'd break the pride, that you'd help our marriages to flourish. I pray for relationships that are in conflict. God, give our church courage to forgive and wisdom to seek reconciliation. I pray for the many parenting burdens that are facing our body this morning, whether it be school decisions or students graduating and transitioning on into adulthood. 
or the lack of harmony that exists in some of our homes. God, I pray that your grace would cover these various situations. I pray for other burdens that we're facing as a church, whether it be financial shortfalls amongst our people, job situations that are burdensome and weighty, legal battles and situations going on in our midst. God, I, I just, I look at all that you're bringing into our lives, God, and the heaviness and the weights, God, we know that you're working all things together for good. Help us, God, I pray, to see your presence in our trials as so immensely good. Help us to rest in your provision. Help us to find joy in the difficult journey. Help us to trust in you. And God, as Pastor Daniel prepares to open the word here this morning, Father, I pray that you guide his heart and mind, give him clarity of thought, give him insights into your truth. Use him now, I pray, in the time that we have remaining. Help him to honor you through his handling of the scriptures and use your truth to impact us in a mighty way, dear God. We will give you all the praise and honor and glory for everything you do in us and through us, for it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I'd ask you to turn to Isaiah chapter 52. The passage that I read during the communion, Isaiah 52. If you don't have a Bible, we invite you to take one of the black Bibles that we have. We'd love for you to own it, take it and keep it. It's found on page 574 or page 613. There's two different versions that we have floating around there. 574, 613. We'd love for you to take one. Isaiah 52, and we're going to look at the last three verses of this chapter this morning. We're coming to the beginning of the fourth and the most famous of the five servant songs of Isaiah. These songs start in Isaiah 42, and I encourage you to take this reading plan that you had in your bulletin and read mostly a chapter a day until you get close to Easter. And if you follow this plan, you'll read from Isaiah chapter 40. You'll read all the way to this passage, Isaiah 53. And then on the week of Easter, you'll read the, the story of the crucifixion in all four Gospels and the resurrection of Jesus in all four Gospels. We come to a section of Hebrew poetry. We're used to that. We've been in the Psalms for a long time. Psalm 53 begins actually in the last three verses of 52. This book called Isaiah could also be called the Gospel of Isaiah because it's so rich with good news. It's good news to a people, Israel, who are in a very bad place because of their wickedness and their sin. God had promised them everything, the world, and gave the, a mission to Israel to be a light to this world. And God promised to be His God to this Israel for the world. And Israel was so full of running after other gods, not trusting in God, but trusting in almost everything else. They were unjust to one another. The leaders were wicked towards the people that they were leading. And there was just constant wickedness. And God, in fulfilling His promises, said, I will punish you. And they are going to be led into captivity into Babylon. But God said, but fear not. I will save you. I will redeem you. I will bring you back and I will make you my people. And I will forgive you of all your sins. He says early on in Isaiah, although your sins may be as scarlet, I will wash them 
whiter than snow. We're now coming to a very famous passage, a passage of Scripture that is quoted seven or eight times in the New Testament by the New Testament authors, quoting this Old Testament passage. I, I grew up in a church, sitting in chairs or pews like this, and hearing the pastor read passages of Scripture for our communion like I read to you this morning. I read to you the end, this servant song, and my guess is as you heard it, and if I were to ask you, did you understand what you heard, read? Some of you might say, some of it. But you might say, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? This is, un- this is not a familiar question. This is not an unfamiliar question because in the early church, there was a man named Philip who came by the Spirit to this desert place and came to a man, an Ethiopian, who was sitting in a chariot, and he was a royal official, and he was reading out loud like would have been custom, and he had the scrolls of Isaiah, and he was reading this passage, and Philip who was a Christian, said, do you know what this passage is about as you read Isaiah? Do you understand what you're reading? And the man said to him, how can I understand unless someone guides me? It is my prayer that this week, not next week, Jason's preaching next week, but then on Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday, we are going to slowly work through this passage. And I hope That with God's help, I will be able to guide you to better understand this beautiful song about your Savior and mine and the Savior of the world. This is a song that brings salvation. It is a song that speaks of a suffering person who came, who was prophesied of, and has now come, and who lived and died. We find that in that story in Acts chapter 8... That when this man was explained what this passage meant, this Ethiopian royal official looked at Philip and he said, there's water. What keeps me from getting baptized? His implication was, I believe I need to be marked by this person. I now trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, let's look at three verses. Verses 13 14 and 15 of chapter 52. I entitled this sermon, The Servant Seen and Summarized. And when I say summarize, I mean it summarizes the whole story of the song, this, these three verses. And it helps, it says, see it. That's the very first word of this song. It says, behold. That means see. See. So follow with me as I read these Three verses. The song goes, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of children of mankind. So, Shall he sprinkle many nations? Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. So if you're a note taker, and I recommend it just for focusing in, here's my three points. My outline of my sermon is this. I want you to see the significance of the servant. I want you to see the success of the servant. And I want you to see the surprise caused by the servant. So the significance of this servant is huge. And it is God's mighty arm coming. And the success of the servant is in God's perfect wisdom. And the surprise caused by the servant is an amazing work of God's redemption. His saving of his people. Let's start by seeing the significance of the servant And it's God's mighty arm. This song begins these three words. Behold my servant. Faith church, behold my servant, God says to us. Yahweh, 
the maker of heaven and earth. There's none, no God like him from beginning to the end. There is, he is the only true and living God. He says, behold, my servant. This is a term that he starts to use in chapter 41. And he continues on through this into this passage. This is the God that is high and lifted up and his train and glory fills the temple and the whole earth. The servant of the Lord is a glorious title. It is a title that has been used by Moses. Moses was the servant of God. David was a servant of God. In Isaiah 41, he says that you Israel, but you Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I haven't cast you out. And then my favorite verse, Isaiah 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my right hand. This word servant, I want you to think of the significance of this word. God says, see, behold, my servant Israel was meant to be God's servant. And what was this servant supposed to do? This servant of God was to serve God by bringing and delivering a message, shining the light of God and who God was, not just to families within Israel, Israel but to shine it to the entire world, to all the peoples, to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people, that there was no other God but the great glorious God of Israel named Yahweh. But instead, Israel was unclean. They were rebels. They were idolaters. They were adulterous people. They were lying. They were unjust. They were, tr un they were not trusting God, but trusting in everything else, including all the other nations, all the other kings they would trust, but not God. And God said, yet I'm not done with you. I'm going to come, and I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to save you, so do not fear. And he tells them in Isaiah 40, 40, behold good news. Say to the cities of Zion, I'm coming, and I will come, and I will shepherd my people like a shepherd, my people like a flock, and I will gather the lambs in my arms and I'll carry them in my bosom and I'll gently lead them. And the servant song begins in chapter 42 when he says, behold my servant. And now we know it's not Israel. He's talking about somebody else, a Messiah that was going to come. And this Messiah figure is going to come and he is going to do something Israel never could do. Moses never did. David never did. This Messiah was going to come. Could it be that he was going to want, be the one that could redeem them from their sins? Could he be the one that would come and heal the sick? Could he be the one who could transform and do what no other leader in Israel could ever do? In Isaiah 42, he says, Behold, my servant to whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He'll cry aloud and lift up his voice and make it heard to the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Friends, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. We read about it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the Jesus who so graciously and tenderly and patiently cared for adulterous women and for prostitutes and for the demon possessed as he healed them to those who were leopard and outcasts in society, to those who were great sinners and tax collectors and not accepted. He was so tender and caring and loving. He's the one that God's got brought God's wisdom and patience to God's people. You see, the significance of a servant, you could read in Isaiah 52, which where we are, and if you read in verse 8, you'd see that they see the return of the Lord to Zion, to Israel, to Jerusalem. And in verse 10, 
The Lord has bared his arm, his holy arm. When God says, I'm going to bear my holy arm, I mean, if, if, I, if I said, I'm going to flex my muscles in a meeting, now, now you might go, that's weird. And that's not possible, Daniel. Or you, might say, or you might take it metaphorically, and you'll go, what you mean is you're going to use your power. You're going to use the influence you have. You're going, to lose the fa- you're going to use the fact that you are a senior pastor or you're the man of God and you're going to bear your arm in that meeting. When God says, I'm going to bear my holy arm before the eyes of the nations, God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to show everybody my power is amazing and holy and glorious and no one will mistake it. This is the arm of the Lord that's coming. I am coming because it is I who needs to show up and transform everything. God says, I'm going to send my servant, and that servant is going to bear my holy arm. And I want you to just see the significance of this servant. He is a mighty and tender arm. And, and I just, I want you to ponder this. God works through serving. We're going to see very clearly, verse after verse, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. God, sir, what God in the universe, what God out there among the other nations or among other religions serves like this? There is no God like this. We as people are not what we were made to be. We were made to be God's servant, to show God off, to love others like God loves, to bring the good news of who this God is, and we don't. And there is a need for another. As we think on the significance of this servant, we realize that God has sent His Son, Jesus, to be a servant to save us. And what we'll see in this passage, and we see and we can't help but think, is that what He'll do for us in serving us for our salvation becomes a model for our imitation. He serves us. We receive it and we serve others. But not only do you want you to see the significant of God bearing his arm, his mighty arm through the significant person, the servant. Let's move number two to the, see the success of the servant in God's perfect wisdom. That, that's most of verse 13. He says, behold, my servant, he shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Israel was God's servant and did not act wisely. Some translations, if you have a New Living Translation, if you have a New American Standard, it says, behold, see, my servant will prosper. So what is it? Act wisely or prosper? Well, it's it's really both. He's saying, my servant, who I'm going to send to be my might, to deal with the people that have a problem. He says he'll act wisely. I really, it's wisdom here in action of prudence, wisdom, doing the right thing that produces the proper results. There's going to come a person, he says, a servant, and he is going to act wisely, and he's going to meet the need in an exact way that it needs to be met. This person will do exactly what needs to be done in perfect wisdom, with perfect precision, in order to accomplish exactly what I need him to do. And he will prosper and succeed. He will act wisely. He will act with care and wisdom and discern the need that's at the hour and will accomplish what's necessary And we see this in this song, he says, he will be high and he will be lifted up. He will be exalted because he succeeded in what God had called him to do. This is the language of God himself. God, in Isaiah chapter 6, is high and lifted up and his robe is filling the temple. And so this servant will be high and lifted up. Friends, we, we gather Lord's Day by Lord's Day, and day by day, we live under 
King Jesus, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, because he succeeded. He is the servant that succeeded, and he did it with perfect wisdom. It was prophesied, and we sing about it at Christmas. We read these passages, like in Isaiah chapter 9, same prophecy, Isaiah 9, where he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Mighty God, the Everlasting God. He's the Prince of Peace. And on of the increase of his government, there'll be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. In Daniel 7, it prophesies that he will be given dominion and glory and a kingdom and people and nations and languages. They'll all serve him. Psalms, the Psalms worship of this. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. Or in Isaiah or Psalm 72, may his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him and all nations call him blessed. You see, this suffering servant that we see is so significant and he is so successful. He acts wisely. He will perfectly do what God needs him to do to accomplish his mission. He will act wisely in him is all the wisdom of God. So what does he do? Well, that's the last two verses. Look at verses 14 and 15 as we see the surprise caused by the servant's work of redemption. There's a shift here. So he says he'll act wisely. And now in verses 14, I want you to notice in our English translations in verse 14 and 15, the beginning of as in verse 14. And so, you know how we use that? As this is true, so this will be. As this is true, so as many were astonished at you. I want you to see there's two things that are shocking about this servant. That are shocking about God's wisdom. It shouldn't surprise us. Isaiah 55 says, but my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts, Israel. How many times have you lived in life and said, God, why are you doing this? This doesn't seem good. This doesn't seem right. And the message of God's word is, God's ways are different than our ways. His wisdom often seems so different than our wisdom. We would do something one way. God has a different plan. And we're about to be shocked by God's wisdom here and what he's doing. And we must cover our mouths and say, And lift up our hands and say, glory. Cover our mouths and not complain, but submit to him. But also lift up our voices and rejoice and say, glory. So what is this shocking thing? He says, first, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond the human semblance and his form beyond the children of man kind. And what we see here first, what should startle the reader, shock and surprise them is the humiliation of my servant. The servant that will be high and lifted up, the servant that acts wisely. What? He's humiliated so much so, it says that he is marred beyond human semblance. We're astonished because his appearance was so marred and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. I, I couldn't help but think about this. because what, what Isaiah is saying is there's going to be a servant. He's going to act so wisely. He's the, he's the hope of the world. He is the might of God. And he is going to surprise everybody because... And I, th- I think there's like a double take that we're all meant to go, what, wait a minute, how does this fit? He's going to be tortured and marred so badly and disfigured so badly, we'll go, is that a human being? And as I've reflected on this, which is the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross, 
his life and his humiliation as a human being, God becoming man, and then ultimately coming to the cross, being mocked, tortured, and crucified in the most publicly humiliating way. I was thinking, how do you express this? I, I, just many thoughts came to my mind, and one of them came to uh, maybe a silly illustration, but maybe one that you can think of is, I wonder how many of you have seen the fun movie, The Princess Bride. And at the end of the movie, The Princess Bride, you know, you have Prince Humperdick, who is an idiot and a buffoon, but has been treacherous, and the noble Wesley. And Wesley is so weak, but he uses his words to threaten Prince Humperdick. And at the end, he says to him, he says, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to fight you with the sword to the death, but to the pain. And the man says, to the pain? What does that mean? To the pain means that the first thing that you will lose will be your feet below the ankles, then, the, then your hands at the wrist, and then next your nose. And then... The guy that's being threatened is proud, and he says, and then my tongue, I suppose, I killed you too quickly the last time, and mistake, I don't mean to duplicate. And Wesley says, I wasn't finished. The next thing you will lose will be your left eye, followed by your right, and then your ears, or I should say, Humper Dick says, then my ears, I suppose, and he says, wrong. Your ears you'll keep, and I'll tell you why you'll keep, so that every shriek of every child at seeing your hideousness will be yours to cherish. Every babe that weeps at your approach, every woman who cries out, dear God, what is that thing, will echo in your perfect ears that this is what pain means. And... I bring this somewhat silly, humorous, but kind of dark humor threat that takes place at the end of the movie to think in terms of, I just couldn't help but go, but Jesus experienced that in the most deep human way. There, there's a sense in which Isaiah says, people will look on him and say, what is that? Is that a human being? Is that really a man? What happened to it? And this is the servant of the Lord who will act wisely and was so humiliated. And as we dig into the understanding of why he did it, our hearts should be moved and melted and sing and obey. To borrow words that we'll get into my next sermon, this is how... this. This is how he describes him. He says, he will grow up like a young plant, a root out of ground. No, he will have no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by man. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That behold the wisdom of God. God says, I will take my servant and he will be humiliated. This is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of the world would say, no way. I will not suffer that way. I could not go the way of suffering. The wisdom of God brings the righteousness and holiness of God and the mercy of God through the suffering of an innocent one himself made flesh the Lord Jesus Christ. So do you see there's the humiliation? That's a surprise to all of us. We should say, how could it be? But then on the other side, so he says, as, he says, he says, as many as are astonished by his grotesque appearance in being marred beyond human semblance, so, and then here's the other side of it. As much as he'll be humiliated, so there'll be global implications of salvation that are so, so glorious. Says, so he will sprinkle the nations. He says, I read this this week, as many as, 
are astonished at you, so shall he sprinkle the nations. Isaiah is thinking of what an Israelite priest used to do. When a leper was cleansed, they would have to go to a priest, sprinkle blood on him to show that he was diseased, was washed away, and he was healthy now, and be ready to accept it back into society as a moral leper. And on the Day of Atonement, a priest sprinkled blood on the mercy seat, making Israel fit for the presence of God, Leviticus 16. Even priests themselves had to be sprinkled with the blood in order for them to be fit to offer up sacrifices. But Christ is both our priest and our sacrifice. He doesn't need to be cleansed. In fact, that sprinkling of his blood is pure enough and lavish enough to clean many nations, according to this passage. He touches the unwashed. He touches the unclean. He touches outsiders. He touches the unpure, you and me, and makes us clean and acceptable to God. And you see what he's saying is, do you, be shocked, be surprised. The wisdom of God is to use the humiliation of the servant of God to bring salvation to the nations for God that we might worship Him. You and I, if we are Christians, if we are saved, as 1 Peter chapter 1 starts with, we have been sprinkled with His blood. We have been cleansed by His blood. Symbolically, as a picture of His blood took away our sins and made us right with Him. The passage I read at communion says that He was pierced, and we would say, where was he pierced? Well, he was pierced with nails in his crucifixion. He was pierced with a sword for our transgressions. He was crushed. When was he crushed? Well, every day as he came and took, took this people despising him and rejecting him, but ultimately on the cross, he was crushed by our sins and by God's wrath against him in our Place. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Dear friends, as we behold, as we look at the servant, as we look at Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, please worship. Please lift up your hearts, maybe with just a, a sense of awe, a sense of tearful and yet joyful gratitude, a type of, God, this is, this is so precious, so deep, I know that I don't understand the profoundness of this, please help me to, and believe, if you're here this morning and you say, this is new to me, or maybe it's not new to me, but it's not been real to me yet, I welcome you to this suffering servant who offered himself up so that anyone who turns away from themselves realizing that they cannot cleanse themselves, but he must cleanse them. They accept, even though they don't understand how it works, why it completely works, but they believe that this servant is the true servant of God. He is God, and he was humiliated, and he was raised again that if you believe on him, he takes away your sins. And as I read earlier in communion, he justifies the ungodly. Faith Church, trust God. Bend to his wisdom. I, I, I guess on a secondary note, know this, that just as God worked this way in his wisdom was humiliation first, then exaltation of his servant. So that is true in your life. Your life, you don't get saved by being humiliated. You get saved because Jesus got humiliated for you. But you will live in a life where he'll say, but I'll call you an imitation to follow your Lord and Savior. And so don't be surprised that this life will be filled with humiliations that God gives you in order to train you and raise you and prepare you to be that light and point you to the one his servant, and ours, who gave himself for us. This is the servant who kings shall shut their mouths because of him. 
they hadn't understood, but now they understand. He is the Savior of the world. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Him. And shouldn't this make us all, as we, as we meditate on these three verses, and as we go into the next chapter, and I encourage you to do that as you, you read through Isaiah, should that not also say, He went before me. I am to follow Him in service. I am to do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in everything with humility. I should count others more significant. I'm, I'm to call, count my, my spouse and my children and my parents and my siblings and my coworkers, my fellow students and my neighbors and those that I, are my enemies and those who hurt me or hate me. I'm going to count them more significant than myself. I am to look at others as more important than myself. And I am to have the same mind as Christ had. I'm referring to now Philippians 2. Although he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. There will come a day when at the name of Jesus, everyone will bow. His humiliation season is, is, is done he will be glorified beyond all glory that we could ever imagine. And we will worship Him, all who have come to trust in Him. And even those who have rejected Him will see clearly He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I've, I do pray that You would please... Help us to look, to see the significance and success and the shock of the servant of the Lord and worship Him and obey Him and follow Him and imitate Him. I pray that as we end this service, this song of Jesus, our suffering servant, would be our cry, and we would glorify him as we sing this. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. When the Ethiopian believed in the Lord Jesus Christ from this passage, he saw water and he said, then what keeps me from getting baptized? Because he knew he needed to be marked by baptism in the waters. And this last Wednesday, one of you said, hey, let's pray that if there is anybody in this church that God is working in their lives and says, you need to be baptized, you're not baptized yet, you need to make that, that public stance that says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I put my lot in with him, I want to be marked by his name, he died for me, I trust in him and him alone. And so if there's someone here that has not yet been baptized, that needs to be baptized, you haven't been baptized yet, will you talk to me? I'm going to be up here at the front afterwards. We'd love to talk to you, hear about your story of conversion, of being a Christian, and perhaps this on April 2nd, two weeks from today, we will baptize you with some others that are getting baptized. And then we've been announcing this regularly. We see, you should see it in our bulletin. If you'd go on Realm to register, or you can contact the church office if you need help as well. We are having a conference on, on overcoming fear and anxiety by understanding about how we should get our fears ordered rightly. We fear God rightly, and that impacts everything. We understand true, truly how, what these do to our hearts when we do not take them seriously or Handle them well. And so would you please come to that. We ask, if you're a member of this church, if this is your church, you're a regular here, please come to this conference. It's one of the ways we equip you for Christian living, for your own soul and for the souls of others. That'll be the, that'll be the weekend, the Saturday after Easter. That's April 15th. And 
we will have a, a lunch that's included in that. We have $20 that's including lunch, but if finances were an issue, we want you to come. It will be covered by people in the church. Here's the benediction. I'll be here to pray with anybody that would like to come up and pray after the service. The Lord bless you. The Lord who is the servant of the Lord. May he bless you and keep you. May he cause his face that went beyond human resemblance, semblance, we couldn't under recognize him. May his face that is now glorious and lifted up shine upon you. He is the source of all blessing and of all forgiveness and all grace and of all peace. And may he give you his peace. And God's people said, amen. amen. You are dismissed.